Welcome back to Book View Now. I'm Jeffrey Brown of the PBS NewsHour here at the AWP conference in Washington. And I'm joined now by Viet Thanh Nguyen. He is the, new, the author of the new story collection, Refu The Refugees, of the Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Sympathizer, and of the recent nonfiction collection, Nothing Ever Dies. So welcome to you. Thanks for having me. I, I wanted to start with, maybe it's a basic question, but it's the word refugees, because mm -hmm. it's an important one to you. Right. What does it mean? Uh, to be a refugee, especially in our contemporary moment, is to be different than an immigrant. Uh, I think immigrants are somewhat acceptable to Europe and the United States, but refugees are the unwanted from wherever they come from, and they're often unwanted where they come to. And especially in the United States, I think Americans think it's un-American to be a refugee. So it's actually really important for me to continually assert, I'm a refugee, I write about refugees, and that we need to think about the necessity of opening our doors and welcoming refugees in. You're living between worlds, mm -hmm. never leaving one behind fully. Why is that so much harder for the refugee than other than the immigrant or others? I think immigrants do feel some of that attachment to wherever they came from, but they've usually made a choice to go somewhere and they've decided to look forward to some extent. Mm -hmm. But refugees are often compelled to leave by violent circumstance they're really still attached to wherever they came from. They're oftentimes looking backwards. So that's where, where I think refugees oftentimes have a hard time adjusting, at least psychologically. They may adjust mm -hmm. culturally and economically, but psychologically, half of them is still somewhere else. So in the, in the first story in this new collection, Black Eyed Women, Woman, the main character is a woman who is Vietnamese American ghostwriter, right? Mm -hmm. So she's actually there but not there right. literally right and so i wanted to make it a, sort of a story that was about ghosts in many different ways she's a ghost writer but she's actually haunted by a real ghost and yeah. that ghost is of her dead brother who she thought had died on the escape from vietnam on a boat and then one night he comes knocking on the door he's literally a ghost who swam thousands of miles to get to her door right and it's about the figurative and the literal hauntings that so many people who've escaped through traumatic circumstances continue to live with. But, but the emphasis is on the real ghost, right? Right. So real as in these people are alive for your characters. Yes, and I think for many people, many cultures, ghosts really exist. Uh, I mean, literally, Vietnamese people, for example, often recount being visited by people who have just died, not to haunt them, but to come and say goodbye. Yeah. But people also really believe in literal ghosts or the experience of being haunted is as if ghosts really do exist for these people. I mean, the, the mother of the, of the main character says, now you know, never turn your back on a ghost. Yeah. Because the daughter wasn't sure, right? right? But the mother always was. Right, and the mother has all kinds of lore about ghosts, like how they always look exactly the same as when you saw them last. Yeah. And for our narrator of this story, she doesn't want to see her brother exactly the same as when she saw him last because it was under terrible circumstances. So, so as I read through the stories in this book, you've got characters who have lived here in the U.S. for a long time. You have stories set in Vietnam. You have Americans going back. How did you, how, how, how did you think about this? I mean, what, what are you exploring through these stories? I think that when I say Vietnamese to Americans or to other people, there might be this idea that there's only one Vietnamese kind of culture or one Vietnamese mm -hmm. kind of people, and I'm going to speak for them. But Vietnamese are just like everybody else, and they're diverse. So this was a collection where I wanted to talk about the young and the old, the straight and the gay, the conservative and the, and the radicals, the ones who stayed and the ones who went back to give people a sense of how heterogeneous and contradictory these people are. And, and of course, this is a collection I understand through time, right? Yeah. I mean, you've been right, these are stories that go back a ways. So what did you see when you went back to pull them together? Do you see a commonality, a theme? Well, you know, the stories began in 1997 and finished in 2014, 17 yeah. years yeah. to produce something that most readers can read in a day. And it was a really difficult experience for me. It's how I learned to be a writer. So my relationship to these stories is really one of trauma. <laughs> like I have a disembodied relationship to my own book. Yeah. And it was really with the help of my editor that we went back and said, okay, well, we should arrange the stories in this fashion to give readers a sense of movement through time. Because the first story, the earliest stories are about coming to the United States. The last story is about returning to Vietnam right. and giving the people the sense that it's not an either or situation for most immigrants and refugees. They don't think of themselves as being, having completed some kind of linear journey but oftentimes a circular one. They do go back to their homeland and then they come back to the United States and they do it over and over again. What about for you as a writer? Because as you're saying, this is you learning to become a writer. 
over yeah, these years. Yeah, and <laughs> that's why it's, it's you know, the first story, the one you talked about, Black Eyed Women, that was 50 drafts over 17 years. Horribly painful experience for me. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless- That's the trauma. That's the trauma, <laughs> but I appreciate it and now that it's over because it made me into a writer. That's yeah. what you have, you, have, you have to struggle in order to be a writer. Yeah. Is it easier now when you look at, when you come to the most recent one? Well, The Sympathizer, I wrote it in two years and it's a much longer and more complicated yeah. novel and it right. was really an ecstatic writing experience. So ecstatic? In, ecstatic. I, meaning? Meaning like it was a really intensely pleasurable most of the time. Except when I talked to my agent and he said, how are we going to sell this book? Then I was right. brought back to earth. Right, but, but I mean, to the writing itself yes. was exciting because you you I, had it in your head and you, it was ready to come out? Or? Yes, and I was possessed by, my, by the voice of my narrator. I was possessed by what I was saying in the book. It was a really passionate novel and I felt passionate writing it. And it was also a lot of fun. And this is very rare, I understand that. So I don't know if I, if I get, ever get that back again. Yeah. So I don't know if the next novel will be written in the same way. Are, are you aware, as, as readers are aware, of the newness of this voice in our literature? I mean, do you feel that? I think so because in order to be a writer, you have to read a lot in the traditions yeah. in which you write. So I've read a lot of yeah. Vietnamese writing, Asian American writing, and American writing, and the novel is explicitly designed to provoke all these different categories and do things that I don't think has been done before in those categories, including in contemporary American fiction. So those categories for the sympathizer I'm thinking of, you can, you can see parallels, you can see Ralph Ellison, mm -hmm. the Invisible Man, you can see Graham Greene mm -hmm. in, in writing and stuff, Spy, right, in or, Vietnam. Yeah. And, 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 and other contemporary Vietnamese and American yeah. literature. So I want the book to be in conversation with these works and yeah. to argue with them because just to choose Invisible Man, it's a very influential book on me, very powerful book I deeply admire, but I disagree with the ending. Uh -huh. So the ending of my novel is not the same kind of ending as you find in Invisible Man yeah. because I want to say, wait, there's another way of looking at this relationship to politics and revolution than what Ralph Ellison does. I, w I want to ask you, I mentioned the nonfiction book, uh, Nothing Ever Dies, Vietnam and the Memory of War. And the, the, it begins with the line, I was born in Vietnam, but made in America. I want to ask you about you and your ghosts. Mm. You know, how much, to what extent you still see yourself as of two worlds? I grew up feeling as if I, had, I was a spy in my parents' household. They were Vietnamese, but I was Americanized. And then I would go out in the American world and feel like I was a Vietnamese spying on Americans. And to some extent, that's never really left me. I'm always in the position of being an observer. No matter where I am, I'm watching people. I, I, I try to hear what they say and look at what they do as an outsider. Mm -hmm. And that has been enormously beneficial as a writer. And so in some sense, I don't want to lose that sense of being haunted, that sense of being a refugee, because it's what's made me the kind of writer that I am. So, so those things, I was just, sorry, I was just, we were just interrupted there. But so that never goes away for you as a writer. I mean, that yeah. helps define you as a writer. It never goes away, but it's also something that I want to cultivate because it's an uncomfortable position to be in between places. Most people want to belong in one place. Mm -hmm. So it's uncomfortable to be in between, but as a writer, that's where you need to be. That's how you get new insight, is to be able to look at something from the inside and the outside. Mm -hmm. So for me to be a writer is to be continually uncomfortable to one degree or another. But that means you don't want to, you don't want to in a sense, leave it behind. I don't want to be settled. I don't want to leave it behind. I don't want to be overwhelmed by it. Yeah. I want to make use out of it. Yeah. I don't want to be mastered by my past, but I don't want to be, I don't want to forget my past either. It, it, memory fading into forgetfulness or mythology. Mm -hmm. We see that in individual memories, larger cultural memories. But you're set, but the title, Nothing Ever Dies. Yeah. It's a dual meaning in the sense that nothing ever dies is both hopeful and terrifying. If what we think of as ghosts never die and they come back to haunt us, that, that would be worrisome for mm -hmm. most of us. But if we think that someone who is dead is actually not dead, that's actually potentially hopeful, that we can still resurrect them or live with their memory in some way. So when you, if we fast forward to today's world and this discussion of refugees and immigrants, do you feel a responsibility as a writer or as citizen to address these things even more? I do feel that as an individual, uh, I'm a politically aware person, but I also feel that as a writer, that I think one of the writer's most urgent tasks is to say something about what's happening in the world today. And I think that the, the sharpening of the political division has really made other writers much more cognizant of that also, mm -hmm. that we need to address the urgent political uh, controversies of our time. So how are you doing that? 
Well, I think the refugees was my way of doing that. Um, and it just happened to be the case that the refugee problem, which have, has always been with us, has come to a head. And now outside of that, I take the opportunity of this platform as a writer to write op-eds, to speak out in public, to go on the Seth Meyers show, and not just to talk about happy things, but also to talk about our history and refugees and immigrants mm -hmm. to a late night audience. Yeah, and, and do, you, do you get, um, do you get a, a sense that the culture is listening? I think so. Either they're listening because they hate refugees and immigrants, or they're listening because they think we should embrace and welcome refugees and immigrants, but people are listening one way or the other. What, what is happening, I'm curious, because the sympathizer, and you just said to me earlier, that Vietnamese American, the experience is so diverse, right? It's not just one thing. What is happening within that community today, politically? Well, I think it's a community that in the past was really defined by the war and by anti-communism, and those feelings still remain. But the community has been here over 40 years now. There's a, a second born, a second generation, or even a third generation born here. Mm -hmm. And inevitably their concerns are different. They're, they see themselves as Americans, or they see themselves as transnationals. Mm -hmm. So there is a certain subset of people who go back and forth between Vietnam who were never born in Vietnam. So it's an exciting time. It's a diverse community, but it's still struggling to some extent with its past. I just wanted just in our last couple of minutes, because I know you also wear another hat as a professor, teacher, right? Mm -hmm. So. What do you see in the students? I mean, what is it that you are trying to convey about either literature or writing, but also bringing in their own experience? I think because the students today, so many of them are, are, at least at my university, really cosmopolitan or they're international yeah. or they have, they have lots of friends in that way. So what I try to do to them is to say, what's happening in the world today in terms of war or migration is not new. If we think historically as the United States, we've always been dealing with wars. We've always been struggling with immigration. And if we know that, then we have a better sense of how to confront our contemporary problems. All right, the new story collection is The Refugees, Viet Thanh Nguyen. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeffrey.